Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the MAE52 virtual discussion series. This is session seven with you again. This is Colin. Well, today, what I wanted to talk about are surfaces. Now, I know in some of the other videos, we've seen demonstrations of surfacing, but what I wanted to do today is dedicate a video to surfacing and talk about some of the other features that we haven't seen yet um, and some things to think about when we're doing surfacing. So surfaces are zero thickness features. And we see a lot of the same features, extrude, revolve, sweep, loft, things like that. Um, but what I've found from experience is that surfaces can be a little bit better to generate complex geometry. While there can still be problems with self-intersecting geometry and things like that that we saw when we're generating solid features, with surfaces, in my experience, again, they're a little bit more tolerant to complex geometry. So I tend to use these when I want to generate more complex shapes. Now, also, if the project has really thin walls, sometimes this also leads me into surfacing um, because the way you think about it and the processes that you go to are a little bit more aligned with surfacing. And then having said that, you can also see that if you're doing stuff that's heavy on lofting, that the profiles that you generate for surfacing are a little bit easier because you don't have to make closed regions anymore like you did with the solids. So it is a bit easier to generate these profiles. Now, if you want your project to be solid, you can, when you're done with surfacing features, you can thicken these and you can create uh, solids from closed volumes. So ultimately you can turn these surfaces back into solid parts. However, you can also have solid features that you've created and then use surfaces to modify these. And this is another way that I use surfaces. So they're an extremely useful tool to know for whatever project you're making, but certainly if you're making things like cars and airplanes, things that are really, again, heavy on lofting, I find the surfaces to be quite a bit easier. All right, with that, let's get started. All right, to get started with surfaces, we're going to start very similar to how we made solid features. We are generally going to put 2D sketches on planes and create the features from that. If we are using more complicated features, such as like boundary surface, filled surface, we may want to start right with 3D sketches, but we've seen examples of this before. Let's, however, just start with a simple example. What I want to do is I want to draw a circular profile. Now, when we've done something like this with solid features, we talked about the importance of having a closed region of the sketch. So SolidWorks could determine what was kind of this infinite amount of space outside of the sketch and the region inside and an extruded material from that. However, when we do this with surfaces, we see something just a little bit different. Instead of having the solid cylinder, we see really this thin wall too. And surfaces, remember, have zero thickness and so do the sketches. So we can see this correlation that what we actually draw with the sketches, the surfaces pick up those lines and that's what it creates as the surface features and the surface boundaries. And you can see the freedom that this allows us in drawing the profiles. And you can see why this make, makes things substantially easier when we're doing lofting and, and boundary surfaces and stuff like that. But we do have to think differently about drawing the profiles because you can see here, if we expect it to have a solid bit of material, we may be a little bit disappointed. And in fact, to create solid material, we have to include a number of other steps. So this also brings us to a point, when to use surfaces and when to use solids. And this gives a little bit of an example of how to make that distinction. Now let's do a little example here. Let's make something like a flag. I'm going to use a combination of solids and surfaces because when I think of the flagpole, I think of something that is probably a solid pole and then for the flag, I think of something that is much larger than the thickness of the material. And that's a great time to use a surface. So what I'm going to do first is draw a simple cylinder again. And what I want to do here is use solids to extrude this as the flagpole. Now, at the top, what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert another sketch and I'm going to draw the profile of a waving flag. And so if we were to want to constrain this to making the flag solids, remember we would have to create the profile. So something like this. And then we would have to offset this or draw another line to try to match this. 
and then we would have to close up the end, so we would have a closed region. And that may be a little bit difficult depending on the geometry. But with surfaces, all we need to do is draw this line. So we've drawn the line, we'll go to surfaces, do a surface extrude. And you can see quickly, we're able to make the flag. Now this is infinitely thin. Again, if we do want it to have thickness ultimately, we can use some of these tools like surface thicken. And if we do that, as a quick example, we can see what it does is depending on the options we pick, it uses the surface as the boundary and then adds material to either one side or both sides. And we've actually seen an example of this when we did the lofting, the solid lofting, we created a tube and we chose thin feature. And when we did that, what it really did is made the loft with surfaces and then used the surface as a defining boundary and added material on each side. And so we can ultimately turn surfaces into solids later on. But I think for the flag, it's actually useful to keep the flag material as a surface because it's so thin. And we can do some other things, like if we add a decal, for example, you can see because the surface has no thickness that this decal shows through on both sides. Because really, even though we see two distinct sides, there's no thickness, so really both sides are somewhat of the same side. If we were to do this on the thickened part, we would actually have one decal on one side, one decal on the other. So from purely a presentation aspect, I think this is a better method. And we've used a combination of solids and surfaces. And up to this point, we may have not seen examples like this, but looking in the feature tree, we have distinct folders for the types of entities that we've created. And that can be useful to sort through them and to also go operate on each one separately, or even show and hide each one separately to perform different operations on the group together. All right, so let's take a little closer look at how to do some simple operations on the surface. What I'm going to do is open up a new surface part, and I'm going to make a similar kind of flag profile again. I wanna make a wavy surface, because I wanna show what should be something simple and a little bit different way to think when you're using solids on how to do this. What I wanna do is I want to do a simple surface extrude, and then I wanna cut a hole in this. So before, when we wanted to cut a hole, when it was a solid, all we would do is find a plane that usually was in the, the, the normal was in the projected direction that we wanted to cut the hole through. We would draw a profile. Let's make something a little bit more interesting here. And then we would simply do an extruded cut. But you can see, if we're in surfaces and we're looking for something that says extruded cut, we won't find it. If we go back to features, we'll find that the extruded cut is grayed out. And this is because we don't have any solid material. Everything has zero thickness. So right now, it doesn't look like that we can cut a hole. But here's where you have to think about surfaces differently. Because they're infinitely thin, we're really treating them more like boundaries and regions of space. So if we want to cut a hole, we really need to find an intersection of how this sketch lays down on this surface profile. And then treating that region, we want to distinguish what's inside the region, what's outside the region, and then remove this bit of surface. So we actually start by creating another surface. We've drawn this profile. We're going to now extrude a surface through the other one. Different than the solids, when you have surfaces touching or passing through each other, they don't automatically fuse together. We've seen that when we make things solid, that if we were to create something similar like this, that these two would fuse together and become one body. In surfaces though, each surface is going to be a distinct body, and you can see now the surface body folder has two entities in it, until we've done things like knit the surfaces together to turn multiple surfaces into one. But this gives us the benefit of using this tool. So because they haven't fused together, we're using this more like a cutting tool. And you can think of, if you're making cookies, for example, you've laid out the dough on a sheet, and now you have the cookie cutter, and you're using that as a tool to basically pull out the inner region. That could be the cookie that you want. We're doing something very similar with the surface here. So we have this surface, and this is kind of our main surface that we wanna keep. 
and we're using this as the cutting tool and we want to remove this region. So this has now created a boundary and we can see two distinct regions. So what we will do at this point to cut the hole is we're going to go into the surface tools and we're going to look for something that's called trim surface. So when we have trim surface, what we're going to do is we're first going to start with standard trim and it's going to ask what is the trim tool? Well, that's our cookie cutter. So it's this surface passing through. The next thing we have to decide is do we want to keep or remove? And these are basically the same thing. They're there because sometimes a region is easier to select than any other. So for example, if we couldn't really select this region, maybe we couldn't see it, it was hard to click on, we could say I want to keep and then select this region. And that's going to retain this, but get rid of this inside part. Or if we say we want to remove, then we can just select this one. So again, it's there as an option if things are difficult to select because maybe they're obscured from view. So let's say keep in this case. And then we're going to select everything that we want to keep. So I want to keep this region and I want that inside piece removed. So I'm going to select that, turns purple, keep, and then I'm going to say, okay. And what's happened now is that inner piece is gone. So ultimately we've cut the hole like we wanted, but we still have the cookie cutter. So this is where you need one more step. What we're going to do now to get rid of the cookie cutter is we're going to use the delete keep body feature. And there's two ways to get it. You can either use the tool itself if you have the button or you've searched for it, or we can go into the surface bodies folder, find the surface body that is the cookie cutter, right click on it and say, delete key body. So now this is different than pressing the delete key on your keyboard. If you press the delete key, it's going to remove all the information. It's going to remove the feature and all the other information that comes from this feature. So if we press the delete key, it's going to get rid of the surface trim because the surface trim depended on this feature. However, if we use delete key body, it's actually another feature that we're adding into our feature tree. So what it's going to do is it's going to remove this but it's not going to delete the information that depended on it. So from this point on, we can no longer use it. It's gone. But anything before it, it will still retain the information that came from that. So now you can see we've created a hole in the surface. So certainly a little bit different than when we're doing solids, but there is a purpose. And this honestly frees you up when you're creating surfaces and complex surfaces. It is better to have something like this trim tool because you can create these regions in the surfaces by having other surfaces pass through and you can really decide exactly what you want to be removed. I want to show you one other thing. So let's get rid of this delete key body feature and let's get rid of this surface trim because I want to show you the other option. There was another one called mutual trim. So I have the same situation here and then what I'm going to do is go to trim and this time I'm going to select mutual. So in this case, what I really want is I want this surface to cut this one and this surface to cut this surface. Ultimately, what I'm going to be left with is a tube that intersects this kind of wavy plate. So what I want after all of the features are finished, I want part of this tube to remain, but then I want a hole in this. So you can see it's almost like a drain in the surface. So in this case, I don't distinguish what is the trim tool. They're both trim tools and they're both surfaces that I want to keep. So I select both. And then in this case, I'll do the keep sections again. And this one is going to look a little bit different. So I'm going to select the things I want to keep, but they're actually going to disappear. So don't let that scare you. It doesn't mean they're going to go away. It actually is just getting rid of them so that you can see the parts that are going to be removed and it helps you visualize a little bit better. So I'm going to say keep selections. I want to keep this part and I want to keep this part. So what we see in yellow is actually the parts that are going to be removed once the entire tool is finished. So we look at that and we say, okay, yeah, we're getting rid of the top part of the cutting tool and we're getting rid of this inside plug. And so we should be left with the sheet and the bottom two. Press okay. And now you can see that we've made a really clever combination of this tube intersecting this plate. And this would be a pretty difficult feature to make in other methods. Another interesting thing to note is in this case, because of the special geometry that we've created, the surface bodies folder now only has one entity in it. So 
if you use the mutual surface trim and you have a situation like this, what it does ultimately is it does fuse the edge of this surface to this surface. So now we are left with just one composite surface when we're done. And this leads us to some other interesting things that we can do, like we can actually fill up this edge. And I'll explain this in just a little bit, but when we're doing fillets, we operate on them just a little bit differently than when we're in solids. All right, let's talk a little bit about adding fillets to surfaces. So what I wanna do with this example that we've created is I wanna add a fillet at the intersection between the tube and the plate. So grab the fillet tool, we're in surfaces. We grab the fillet tool, we select this edge, and we can see it creates a nice fillet on the interface, right? And this is really nice because we've created this with surfaces, we could thicken this. And this would be a little bit of a complicated part to create with solids, but once we thicken it, we create a solid quite easily. And having this fillet in there before we create the solids ensures that we have basically a matching fillet on each side after the material has thickness again. But let's look at the fillets a little bit more carefully because we can't use them everywhere in surfaces. In fact, we can't even use them nearly as much as we do in solids. I wanna create a simple example. I'm going to create a T shape and I'm going to try to add a fillet between the two plates. So I'm doing this all with surfaces. I'm going to do a simple surface extrude here. Now, if we were building this with solids and you can imagine basically two plates that intersect each other, we would be able to add fillets, no problem, in the corners here. But let's try to do this with surfaces. So we go and try to add a fillet here and it doesn't allow us. What it gives us is this message that says laminar edges cannot be filleted. Now, I don't think that's very descriptive of what's going on. But let's look at the geometry. And you can imagine if we wanted to add a fillet right here, it would have to add material and it would have to add solid material in between the two plates. And of course we're in surfaces, so it can't do that. So you're starting to see what the real problem is, is that it's really not going to be able to keep this continuous sheet. There would be either adding a new little sheet as the fillet, so then you would have kind of these multiple surfaces, um, or it would have to add solid material. Really no option here. And so what I like to do when I'm thinking about could I add a fillet to a surface is trying to imagine could I bend a sheet, a thin sheet of metal or paper into the shape that I want with the fillet. So here you could try to imagine taking a single sheet and trying to bend it in the sh into the shape you, and you couldn't do so with the fillet. But let's adjust the geometry just a little bit. So I'm going to adjust the sketch so that it's really just an L instead of a T. All right, now with this, could we imagine if we were to have kind of a block that had a rounded edge, could we take a single piece of thin metal or paper and bend it around that corner with the fillet? And the answer would be yes. And you can see here, all I've done is change the geometry just a little bit by basically making this only one half of that T. And now we can add the fillet. So that's what I think is the best method about how to think when you're asking, could I add a fillet to the surfaces? And if we go back to our example and we're thinking, okay, well, this looks a little bit like the T. We have this sheet kind of in the, we, we have this sheet in the middle of this sheet. Isn't that more like the T? And the answer is no, because imagine taking a little thin cut and kind of unfolding the surface. If we did that, this would actually look more like the L rather than the T. And you can see we have this really distinct interface between the sheet and this tube. And so with that single edge, we can add the fillet to it. So that's a really good way to think if you want to add the fillet. And like I said, it's much easier to add the fillet now and then thicken this part than thickening it first and adding the fillet. So sometimes the order can be important here. Now, there's something interesting we can also do with surfaces. So imagine that we're trying to manufacture this part. And what we want to do is we want to figure out how to cut out this piece of material how big it needs to be so that we can stamp it onto our wavy mold, right? And so there's a tool in surfaces called surface flatten. And 
In older versions, I don't think this tool existed because I know specifically I had a project where I was making basically these templates onto a curved panel. And what I had to do is I had to print out large pieces of paper and my first attempts at the template, try to lay them into the surface and then trim them to fit. And this is really difficult. Had I known that this feature existed or this feature did exist and maybe it didn't, um, what I could have done is created a region, created a surface from that and then unfolded the surface and got a flat template. So that's what this tool really is meant to do. We can take this curved and wavy surface and we can unfold it into a flat sheet so that we can see what a template, you know, cut out of a thin, a flat piece of material or printed on paper would need to look like. So we grab the surface flatten tool, we select the surface that we want to flatten, and then we select the edge basically that we're going to rotate about. So we've selected this surface to flatten and we could select this edge, we could select this edge, but let's pick this edge for now. So in the edge uh, box, we select that. And now we can see that it has unfolded that surface into a flat piece and has created another surface from that. So we could actually add this as a separate piece in the same part file. And that brings me to a very important thing that you can do in SOLIDWORKS called configurations. This is really, really important. So if you're creating a part, the configurations allows you to basically add different features, different sizes of features, or ultimately different main pieces of the part, but still retain the same part file. And this has to be used with care. Because when you're going to assembly, or if you're really manufacturing things, in general, you don't want the same part number, but have a completely different part. This is very bad practice, and, and it can lead to manufacturing errors. But certainly, this can be very useful for this presentation aspect, or I've used this for kind of brainstorming through a part. Maybe I'm trying to figure out the best fit or the best you know, place to add a certain feature, and I create different configurations, put it into assembly, and then ultimately make a choice. So there's many different ways to use this configuration tool. Now, something like this would be excellent. So this is the part that we ultimately want. But in the configuration, we have basically a flattened version of the part. So here's what we're going to do. Above the feature tree, we see this one tab that says Configuration Manager. We select Configuration Manager. What we do here is we see right now there's only a default configuration because when you start any part, you just get one configuration. Now let's say we want to add one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and I'm going to say add configuration. And we'll, we'll say this is going to be flattened sheet. Okay, so now what you can see is that in the configurations, we have two now. One of them's grayed out and one of them's active. Now to switch between the two, all you have to do is double click on the configuration that you want. So we can double click on default, we can double click on flatten sheet, and we could have many more configurations if we needed to. So let's click on default. So in default, let's say we don't want the flatten feature. So what we do is we make sure that the default configuration is active, and then we simply suppress the features that we don't want. So here what we're going to do is suppress the surface flatten. So this is our default part configuration. Now, let's go back to the Configuration Manager and double click on Flatten Sheet. Now, in this case, what we have is everything that is unsuppressed. So, when you select a configuration, when you make a new configuration, it's going to start from where you left off. So, if we create another configuration, let's go back to Default and let's create another one say that says um, surface extend. So in this configuration, we're going to start with, and let's roll down to the end and let's suppress these. We're going to start with basically whatever we had in the default. Now when we add to it, here's something that's going to be very interesting. So let's do a surface extend. Right here, I'm going to use the Extend tool. It's right above the Trim tool. And I want to increase the edge length. So what I select is the surface edge. And you can see that it simply adds 
surface, basically continuing the information from that surface. So this is a pretty easy um, situation here where the surface was mostly flat, or it's, it's kind of quasi 3D, so it's really easy to add the extension. Now, if we had a, a more unique curved surface, when we add the extension, we'll have to be a little bit more careful about how um, the surface continues off the edge of that surface. But here, we're just able to basically increase the size of this part. Let's add another extension to this edge. So you can see here, it's following basically the missing inf information of that surface. And that's because we have selected the extension type as the same surface. If we selected linear, it's basically going to create a surface that is tangent to that surface, but continuing in a linear direction. So some different ways to add the extension onto the surface. But okay, we've added two surface extensions. And this was all into the part configuration that was called surface extent. Now let's go back to default. So we double click. You can see that those configurations or those features in that configuration went away. And all we're left with were the features that were in the default configuration. And so that was the fillet, the thicken. Now, let's say that we wanted to go back and we wanted to modify the default configuration so that it didn't have the fillet and the thicken. All we do is we can select those two and say suppress. So now this is our default configuration. But the important part is when you're in an active configuration, when you add a new feature, it just adds it to that configuration. In all of the other configurations, those features are suppressed. So let's go to flatten surface. So in this one, all we have is the flattened surface. And the reason we have this other part is because when we created the configuration, um, we still had these configurations unsuppressed. We just had the, the status rolled back. So it's a little bit different. If we roll back this line, it's just temporarily suppressing the features. If we actually want to suppress them in a configuration, we need to actually highlight them and suppress them, right? And then we can take this body, and we can do delete keep body, and so now in the flattened surface configuration, all we have is that piece. So ultimately what we've created here is some different ways to look at the part. This is the default configuration that we are working on. This is the flattened sheet configuration. And then this surface extend is our default configuration, but with some added features onto it. So I think this configuration tool is really helpful, especially at early stages of the project, but certainly if you want to not change your part um, in a large amount, but add something to it. Another place I've used, it, I've used this, when I make 3D printed parts, a lot of times I'll add a thin sheet to the very bottom of them so that they stick to the plate better and print. Now, really what I want is the part that I've created. So this extra feature that I've added is something only for 3D printing, and I'm really not changing the part enough to maybe warrant having this part in a completely new file. So what I do is I add another configuration called 3D print plate or whatever name I need. And then I add that thin sheet on the bottom that's going to print to help that process happen better. But then when I wanna to go to assembly or I wanna just look at the part itself, I wanna look at it in its default configuration. Right, so this brings one more important thing about the configurations. Let's go ahead and add this to an assembly. So we'll save this as something simple. We'll call this um, plate and tube. Okay. Now when we add this into assembly, here's how we change the configuration of the part we want. Because again, the configurations are all in the same part file. So when we add these into assembly, they're all going to look the same until we change the configuration. So we've added a part into assembly. What we do is we right click on the part. We can either do it here or we can do it in the assembly feature tree. We go to component properties. And if we have created more than one configuration, right here in the reference configuration box, we can choose which one we want to show for that instance. So let's say right here, we want it to be the default configuration. So I select okay. You can see that this instance is the default configuration. Now let's make a duplicate of this part. Let's actually make a triplicate. So right now we have, we have four of them, that's okay. Let's change the configurations for each of these. So let's keep this one default. Let's make this one flattened. So again, look, they're all the exact same part file name. What we can do is right click, component properties, and make this one flattened sheet. 
right click, component properties, and make this one surface extend. So from the same part file, we have really three different parts and as many configurations as you need. And you can see how this can be useful, but how it has to be used with caution because while you could build an entire assembly with really the same part file, you shouldn't because if the former function has cha changed significantly, you should create a new part. Okay, now let's take a look at boundary surfaces and filled surfaces. So these are two really useful tools that allow us to explore complex and unique geometries, but they can be a little bit challenging and time consuming to set up. So with both of these tools, what we're really doing is giving information about the boundaries of the panel we're trying to create. And we've seen some example of this when we were doing the car and trying to create the panels of the car. What I'm going to do is start with the boundary surface. So I'm going to start by creating four unique boundaries, and that's a criteria about the boundary surface. You need to provide it four unique entities or more. You just basically, every boundary has to be its own entity. I'm going to start with 3D sketches, and let's go ahead and just put in one sketch to start. So with this beginning sketch, there's really no restrictions or criteria besides the geometry that I'm trying to create. However, for the remaining sketches, I do need to be careful that the boundaries are touching. So I will want to make sure that the boundaries are at least coincident to each other, and better yet, if I can make the other sketches coincident to the endpoints of this. Now, if we had another panel already created, and this is a really useful aspect of the boundary surface, we will want to make sure that we use one of those boundaries, if we want to have things like tangency between the panels, use one of the edges of that panel as a boundary, and make sure that any additional sketches or boundaries that we use are also coincident and touching. So what we're going to do is add another 3D sketch. I want to make sure that I have a distinct sketch in there. Sometimes you can accidentally be on a sketch that you've created, add in another piece, and then you really won't have a distinct boundary. So you do want to be careful. Each one as a unique piece. Okay, so I add another sketch here, make it coincident, and we'll create that piece of geometry. I'll just go around and do the same thing. So there's two boundaries. We'll add a third boundary. In all of these, I want to make sure that, you know, I don't have really sharp changes in curvature that can sometimes create undesired results. And of course, I don't want really any parts of the sketch crossing back over the panel that can also create some undesired results. So I'm watching out for that with each one of these sketches that I put in. And for the last one, we'll just go ahead, 3D sketch, and we'll make sure it's coincident, and then we'll make it coincident. Okay, so what I need to do here is modify this geometry because it's crossing over the panel. So we'll just walk it back here a little bit. And I'm going to be a little careful on this last one to make sure it kind of resides entirely on the outside of the panel. So looking from all the angles, I want to make sure that, again, not sharp changes and not crossing into the panel. This will just make the panel look a little cleaner for our demonstration. Okay, that looks pretty good. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up the boundary surface. And the way we want to think about this is SolidWorks is going to do a loft from one side to the other and then in somewhat of an orthogonal direction. And then it's going to kind of smoothly interpolate what's happening in the middle of the panel. Now, boundary surface and filled surface both work with giving it just the information of the, of the edge like we've done here. But what's really unique about boundary surface in particular is that we can choose what happens at each one of the boundaries individually. And so if we have other adjacent panels, this becomes extremely useful. Right now, we have a boundary setup that will work with both filled and boundary surface. Okay, so we do our little checklist. We made sure they're all coincident. We don't have any sharp changes in curvature, things like that. And then we have four distinct pieces for the boundary. Okay, great. So we'll open up boundary surface. And for direction one and two, it really doesn't matter uh, which ones you start with. But what you want is in each direction, you want kind of opposing boundaries. And I've made this somewhat square just to illustrate that point a little bit better. So for direction one, let's select this sketch. And then we want to select this one. We could still generate a boundary surface if they're somewhat adjacent, but really how this works is it's going to be a loft from one side to the other, and then turning and going loft from this side to the other side. 
All right, so we've gotten a little bit of a preview, but you see how it's twisted? Now, you could just start by dragging the connectors. I think it's easier though, when you get a preview, if it's twisted, you can right click on the preview and say flip connectors. And this usually straightens everything out. If it doesn't, you can modify the connectors individually, or if that's still not creating what you want, it may be a problem in the geometry itself. So you wanna double check at that stage. Okay, so that's it for direction one. Now for direction two, we're going to pick the remaining boundaries. And you can see as we do that, the boundary surface starts to kind of stretch to meet up with those boundaries. And we get a little bit of a preview. All of these flags are what the boundary conditions are. And because these are just simple sketches, we really don't have many options. We can either have normal to profile, which won't really work here because of the 3D sketch, direction vector, or none. So direction vector would only work if we provided another sketch that told the, pa the panel to kind of curve and, and move off in a direction at that boundary. But let's leave it right now at none. So we're satisfied with all the boundary conditions. If we wanna look at a little bit different view of this panel, we can go down here and look at the mesh preview. Sometimes I do this um, just to get a little better idea what's going on in the middle and see if anything is severely warped, but this looks pretty good here. So we'll select that and now we have a boundary surface, right? And what I'm going to do now is just hide the boundary surface and create the same thing with filled surface so we can have a little bit of a contrast. So what I'll do is I'll suppress the boundary surface, but I'll still use the four sketches. So I'm going to show those. And we'll use filled surface. So filled surface works in a similar way, except we just don't have quite the same level of control. But honestly, it's a little bit more easy to use because we don't have the same restrictions of having individual pieces of each um, boundary. We could have done this all in one sketch. So it can be quicker. And a lot of times it gives you a faster way to see if the panel is going in the direction that you like. And also if you have some missing information, it can be helpful. So in the patch boundary, what we're going to do is we're going to select all of the pieces that close the boundary. So in this one, we need to close the boundary and make sure that we have no holes when we create the filled surface. And you can see here, this one looks identical to the boundary surface for this particular case. Now, we can get a little bit more control in the filled surface by adding a constraint curve. So if we had another piece of information going kind of in the middle of the panel, we can add that in the constraint curves that allows us to kind of pull the panel and warp it a little bit closer to what we want. So in that respect, it's a little bit more like the boundary surface. And we can also change what happens at the edges and the constraints. So you can see very similar, but we don't get the same options to change each boundary individually. So that's a filled surface and we can see that it'll be the exact same. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that for now. Okay, so what I wanna do is jump back to the boundary surface and we'll, we don't need to make any modifications, but I wanna create another one um, because I want to show you what's really unique about the boundary surface. So I'm going to create a panel that comes off of this side. Let's go ahead and hide these sketches. Now, I have to be careful. So my intent here is to make the panel smoothly leave and meet up with the next panel. So I really want it to be tangent. And to start, I need to make sure that the entities that I'm providing are in fact tangent to this panel or else it won't work when I add the tangency constraint in the boundary surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in some more 3D sketches. So we're going to start at this corner. I'm going to add a 3D sketch. And I'm going to make sure that I'm coincident to the corner. And you can see that when I get near it, this black dot shows up indicating that I am in fact going to make it coincident to the corner of that surface panel. All right, so we'll start by just making um, some part of the sketch. And then what I'm going to do is go back. I'm going to select either the panel or the edge, and let's do the edge here, and hold control and select this sketch and tell them to be tangent to each other. So what's happening here is this sketch is now smoothly leaving the edge of this panel. And it makes sense. If I want the rest of the panel to be tangent, well, I want it to be tangent in here, but it also needs to be tangent at the edge. So I need to make sure these, sketch, these sketches are tangent. If you don't, what happens is when you go into the boundary surface and you select the tangency constraint, it will just tell you that 
it can't impose that because at the edges, basically, you didn't make the sketches tangent to the panel itself. Okay, so that'll be just fine for this particular sketch. Get out of that. We're going to do the same thing on the other side. So 3D sketch. Again, make sure it's coincident. And make this look just a little bit different. Maybe we'll do that. Okay, and then once again, I wanna select the sketch, select the edge and say tangent. And of course I can modify the handle to see how far the tangents tangent influence moves out along that sketch. Okay, perfect. Now I'm going to finish by closing the boundary. So we'll add another 3D sketch. Make it coincident here and finish it at that sketch. Okay, perfect. Now, in the case of this, I'm only going to provide three new sketches. And the reason for that is I'm going to use the last boundary piece of information as the edge of the panel that I've created already, right? And so what that's going to do is it's going to ensure that not only have I made it tangent by just the sketches here, that I can impose the tangency boundary condition and make sure that the panel blends smoothly into the next one because it's going to be tangent in the middle where basically I haven't provided any information yet. So again, now I'm going to go back to boundary surface. And now for this one, for direction one, I'm going to select the edge of the panel I've created and then this sketch. So that's direction one. And then in direction two, I'm going to select the other sketches. Okay, great. So it generated the panel. We don't see any strange warping or twisting, but the last thing I need to do is find the boundary conditions. And right here is the one I can impose. I'm going to change this from none to tangency to face. And because we were careful about making sure the edges are tangent, it didn't really have to do anything in here. If we had um, different changes in this geometry, you would see that this propagation would happen and, and it would warp the panel a little bit. We can also go back to the influences here, tangency, and we can select how far, or how, how, what percentage of the tangency influence we want to hold, right? And you can see that how that changes the panel. So these boundary conditions are really what makes boundary surface unique. I'll get out of that. And now, even though we see a little bit of a line here, we're going to go to evaluate curvature, and we're going to look for sharp changes in color across the boundary. And those smooth changes help show us that really there's no cusp here because sometimes it can be hard to detect. We can also show this with zebra stripes and the, the continuity of the stripes across the boundary indicate that it is a smooth uh, blend between the two panels. All right, so we can see how versatile and unique boundary surface is, but yes, it is a little bit of a challenge to set up. So, Sometimes you'll want to use a combination of boundary surface and filled surface um, to create the panels that you need. What I'm going to do is just kind of finish by closing up this boundary. So what I'm going to do is add another sketch here and we'll do a filled surface. So I'll add a 3D sketch, snap to the corner. So that looks pretty good and we can make a, a little bit of a modification here. Now let's use a, um, a 3D or a, a filled surface rather. Okay, so we selected that edge or that sketch and we'll select this edge and we'll select this edge. And you see it closes up the boundary. Now we have limited amounts of things we can do, especially because we didn't take any care to make sure that this sketch um, leaves tangent to the face. So we'll just leave this as contact for now. Let's go ahead and close up the other side. So we'll use another 3D sketch. And again, we'll use a filled surface here, again, because it's a little bit easier. So back to surfaces, filled surface, select that sketch, that edge, and that edge, filled surface. Okay, so the reason I want to do this is because I want to create a closed volume and we can see what happens. So right now, the last thing I'm going to do is create a patch with the remaining edges. I'm going to try it by using filled surface. So what we're going to do is select that edge, that edge, that edge, 
and this edge. And you can see because it's a closed boundary, there was no holes in it, that it's able to provide a patch using the filled surface. And there's a reason I want to do this. So this is a pretty unique piece of geometry. This would be hard to create in many other ways, but for us it didn't take too many steps. But there's something important we can do from this. This is a surface. Let's take a look. We're going to slice it open. And we can see that it's completely hollow inside. It's just a simple surface. And remember, the surfaces, again, have zero thickness. What we can do, however, is we can turn this into a solid. So there's a tool called Knit in surfaces. And we talked about how surfaces, every time you create one, even if they're touching each other, even if they're you know tangent, they don't fuse together into one surface. That's because the surfaces require you to knit them together to decide which surfaces are, are truly connected and which surfaces aren't. So under knit surface, we select adjacent surfaces and we can adjust the gap control. So here we're really careful, but when you start getting really complex geometry, sometimes the surfaces don't perfectly match up and you can adjust the gap tolerance to fill in small holes between the surfaces. Here we don't have any holes. So when we say knit, what's going to happen is it's going to connect these surfaces. It doesn't look any different, but you can see that the surface bodies folder went from five to having four. And the surface knit is this composite of the two panels that we've made, right? But I wanna show you. So as we continue to knit the surfaces together, so now we're going to select that. We're going to select this, this piece. So I want you to watch right here. As I select the last one, if I have truly a closed volume, really a like watertight or airtight volume, then I have this option to create solid. So what I'm going to do is select create solid. And after it finishes knitting, it's going to create a whole surface. It's going to fill it with material and then remove the surface. So let's look at one more thing. So again, we have a surface bodies folder and no solid bodies folder. I'll go to knit, I'm going to select all these pieces. Again, the create solid option showed up. We say create solid and we'll press OK. All right, so now we have we no longer have a surface bodies folder. We only have one solid body, and we can look at this by sectioning it, and it truly is full of material. So this is yet another way to create a solid from a surface. Not only can you thicken it if you wanted a, you know, a shell of your part, but here we can create a completely solid piece of material with a really unique geometry. This would be hard to build if we just went straight to the solid feature. So oftentimes you'll go surface to solid, and then you can use surfaces to even modify the geometry further. So let's take a look at that. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw just a 2D sketch, but I'm going to create a surface from this 2D sketch. extrude surface. I'm going to make sure it extrudes all the way through. We can just do mid plane here, all the way through the part. So now again, I'm treating this similar to trim like a cutting tool. And then under surfaces, I have this option to cut with surface. So we've seen a little example of this before when we use something like split. We make a surface, go through another surface or solid, and we can use the split tool, especially if we want to save the part that's being cut away. If we simply want to just modify the geometry, we may not want to go to the trouble of split. We can use the cut with surface option. And then what we're going to do is select the surface. And then this arrow is going to say, which direction do you want to cut in? Do we want to cut to this side or do we want to cut to this side? It really means which piece of the solid are you going to remove? So in this case, we're going to remove this side and this side is going to remain. Press okay. Okay, so now the surface has cut the solid. And then just like we did last time, we're going to use the delete keep body feature to get rid of the surface cutting tool. And now we're left with the solid still, but it's a modified solid. So in this case, we've used surfaces to create a solid. And then we used another surface to modify the solid further so that we can have an uh, even more unique um, geometry. Okay, let's look at a couple other examples of using tools and surfacing and making some parts from some of these tools. Let's start with what we'll call a bifurcated tube. So really the tube's gonna start as one tube and then at some point branch off into multiple segments. 
Let's start by inserting a circular profile. We'll give it a dimension here. And we'll extrude this in one direction. I'm going to make this all with surfaces. OK, so right here at the end of the tube, it's going to branch off into two segments. So I'm going to do this with a surface sweep, which means I need a profile and, the, and a path. So I'm going to insert the path now. I'll make sure that it starts right here at the origin. And I've built this part carefully so that uh, the, the plane here, the front plane, can be used to draw the profile on. All right, And we'll make sure that it is normal to the profile to get the best results. That looks pretty good for a path. OK, now what I'm going to do is insert on the front plane a new sketch. And I'm going to select the edge of the pipe and do a convert entities. This means that if I ever need to change the pipe, it's going to change the profile at the same time. All right, so I have a profile and a path. Now what I'm going to do is create one branch and then near the other branch over. So we're going to have a couple segments occupying the same space. So we'll do a surface sweep. We're going to select the profile and the path, and we create one branch of the two. OK, and then as I mentioned, we're going to select the right plane for mirroring. We'll go Features, Mirror. And remember, because it's a surface, we need to do Bodies to Mirror. So we'll select this surface body. And we'll create the other branch. All right, so it looks from the outside like we have a bifurcated tube. But because these two tubes intersect right here, what we have is basically a clog. If you go down the tube, it starts going in one direction, and then it kind of gets jammed. So what we really need is to trim out the parts that are mutual between these two tubes. And if you remember, the trim tool in surfaces has a mutual trim, which will be perfect for this case. So what we're going to do is we're going to select these two surfaces. And then we're going to select the parts we want to keep, which will be this part of the tube and this part of the tube. So you can see the intersection of the two right here. This is what creates the jam, which wouldn't allow anything to flow down this tube. So it's going to get rid of this part when we execute the trim tool. Now you can see that it has fused these two tubes together. So this is all one section. And then we have this initial straight one piece section of the tube. And if we want to look at a section view right now, look from the top, we can see that right here, we do have an opening to go down each branch. So the last thing we'll need to do is we'll need to create one surface. So we'll go thicken, or uh, knit, rather. We'll knit these two together. And then we'll use the thicken tool. It might be advantageous to put in a, a fillet here if uh, it will allow us. So we'll try the fillet tool. And this will just help smooth up the interface a little bit. And now we can use the thicken tool. So we'll thicken it. And now we have a solid bifurcated tube created pretty easily from the surfaces. Now, you could also make this from solid features. Um, but I think it's very intuitive to create this with the surfaces using things like trim on the intersection of the two tubes, and then ultimately thicken the tube. So I mean, I know this is a kind of a simple example, but this helps you think a little bit differently about how to assemble some of these surfaces into a part that you want. I want to show you another tool that can be quite useful. So we'll make another surface here. And you can use this tool in both surfaces and solids. It's called the freeform tool. So in the freeform tool, it allows you to basically warp faces of a part by really just kind of adding control points and pulling on the face. So it's really useful to create unique geometry. Like you can imagine the hand grip on a handlebar or something like that. Um, now, you can provide some control by putting in initial sketches that help you kind of conform to the shape that you want. But again, the benefit of the freeform tool is just that. It's free form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a tube. Now, one important thing, I need a face to warp. Now, because this is a continuous face around the tube, 
the freeform tool will not like to operate on the tube as it is. What I need to do is actually segment this tube to have a front face and a back face. Because this is a surface, one of the easiest ways to do this is really just split the surface. Now, for this tool, because it can operate on solids and surfaces, you would use the same procedure. We're going to do a split face, and then that's going to segment the face into two different regions. So here's how I'm going to do that. I'm going to insert a sketch, and just because I want a front half and a back half, all I need is a single line that operates like a cutting line. All right? Now what I'm going to do is, in either Features or in the Surfaces tab, I'm going to go to Curves and Split Line. I'm going to use this sketch as the split line. We're going to do a projection split, and I'm going to select this as the face. And we don't want to select single direction because we want it to split on both sides. So when we do that, you can see that now it's it looks like it's cut the surface. However, it's a little different. If we use something like the split tool, it would have truly cut this into two halves. We would have two surface bodies in the surface bodies folder. The split line is a little bit different. It just cuts the face and splits the face into multiple regions, but doesn't cut the part. Now, because the surface has zero thickness, this almost is like it cut the surface in two pieces. But again, we still just have one surface in the surface bodies folder. Now we can pick this half to do the freeform tool on. So what we're going to do is select the freeform tool. And now we need to pick a face. So we'll pick this front face. And then what it's going to do is it's going to add a grid onto the face that allows us to start modifying the geometry. So the first thing we want to do is add a curve for adding the control points. So what we'll do is we'll say add curve. And then when we hover over the face, you can see that this straight line shows up on the face and we will select where we want that curve to be. So we're going to select right in the middle, and that's where we've put our first control line. We can add multiple ones, but in this case, let's just add one for now. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to add control points. So we add points, and everywhere along this line, we're going to drop in a point where we need it to be. So we'll drop one here, we'll drop one here, and we'll drop another control point down here. Okay, after we finish that, We'll press right click to get out of that. What we can do is we can gra grab onto these control points and start dragging the surface. So let's look from the side. So as I grab on that and modify it, you can see it pulls the face out into a new position. Now again, it's free form. So there's really no dimensions we can put in here. Um, we can't necessarily snap these points, but with some geometry that we've drawn previously, we could kind of drag these points into a position. But the benefit of this is creating complex geometry with really low cost. Now, at the boundaries, we can also choose what to have what, what happens. So right here, it starts off basically normal to the profile, but maybe we want this to kind of bulge out along with this control point. We can switch this from contact to movable, and then we can modify the direction of this arrow um, as desired. So there's a lot of freedom in this tool, but again, it's just a little bit less precise than drawing you know, distinct boundaries. Sometimes, however, this can be the exact right tool for the job when you have a difficult geometry. So we can think about some of the fenders on the car, maybe a little bit difficult to generate with a boundary surface or a filled surface. This is almost like virtual clay. So this is a really good tool for that. Um, additional, additionally, you can see things like handle grips um, are really easy to generate with this type of tool. And of course, we can take this, and if we did this with surfaces and decided we wanted it to be solids later, we could always cap off this surface. So we could go filled surface, cap this off. We've seen this example a couple times. So there's one cap. We'll provide another end cap here. And now, if we knit this together, so we'll knit this, this, and this, we could create a solid from this part. So that's an example of using the freeform tool. And then the last thing I want to show you is taking something like this and creating a mold from it. So it's, it's more in the solid 
features realm, but since we've created some of these unique geometries with surfaces, this is a great time to show it. So what I'm going to do here is actually take this solid, and so we see here it's a solid, and I'm going to say this is the part that I want, but I want to create two mold halves, so maybe we're doing some sort of injection molding or something like that. So what I'm going to do is basically I'm going to create two blocks, one on each side, but I want to make sure that they don't merge with this part. So I'm going to start by doing something like this. So I'm going to create a rectangle around this, completely surrounding it. So you, you can imagine that this is basically one side of the mold. Exit sketch. And then what I'm going to do is do a solid extrude boss. And I'll make sure that it completely surrounds the material, but I want to make sure, this is really important, make sure to deselect merge result. All right, so now what I have is I have two solid bodies with part of, one, part of them occupying the same space. This is perfect for doing a Boolean operation, this combine operation, which we've seen an example with the tire, but I think this is almost a better example of really how to use this Boolean operation. So we're going to select the combine tool, and if you need to search that, you can, combine tool. And in this case, we're going to do a subtract, right? So the bodies to combine, are these two, but the main body is going to be the mold half. So we're going to select the mold half as the main body, and we're going to choose this handle to be the body to subtract. Show preview. And you can see what happens here is that body has now removed basically the material that it was occupying from this main body, our mold half, that was in the same space. And this has created a mold cavity. Now it doesn't look like much from this view, but we can see if we section it open, it does have the contour of the handlebar. So now we've seen a variety of different surfacing tools and how we can really create complex and unique geometry with relative ease. And we've seen that, you know, although surfaces have zero thickness, ultimately we can create solids from these surfaces if we desire by doing things like thicken or knitting the surfaces together in a closed region and creating a solid from that volume, or even something like just cutting a solid that we've already created with a surface. So taking an example like this, this is created with a combination of surfaces and then using surfaces to cut the solid, we have a, a pretty unique complex geometry here. And we've seen how we can take something like this and even go a step further and create molds. So we've seen that Things like configurations really help us to have our part that we ultimately want, but in the same part file have something like the top half of a mold or the bottom half of a mold for you know, rapid development of this type of part. Additionally, we can see that even this parting line for the mold halves was created using a surface and split. So the surfaces are very, very powerful and useful not only just to make a project, but to modify existing parts and projects that you have. As everything does, these surfaces take a little bit of time and patience to learn, but an extremely important tool to have in your kind of SolidWorks knowledge to move that step further and create ultimately what you want. Anybody making things like humanoid figures, cartoon characters, airplanes, cars, boats, I mean, Many of the complex things that we want to create in SolidWorks will use surfaces at some point. So I really hope this has helped and you've learned something new in addition to those uh, car and airplane tutorials that we've had that have introduced some of the surfacing, but this has some of the finer points of what you can do on surfaces. As always, I thank you so much and we'll see you next time. So